Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this, the second of uh, our City Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council's series of talks exploring the Government of Ireland Act and the birth of Northern Ireland. <clears throat> My name is Vincent McCann, I'm the director of the theatre, and I'm part of the Council's NI 2021 project team. I'm delighted <clears throat> that this evening's seminar will be presented by Dr. Alan F. Parkinson, and my thanks to Eamon Phoenix for arranging this. <clears throat> um, Dr. Parkinson is a graduate of Queen's University of Belfast. He's a former senior lecturer in history at London South Bank University, and the author of a number of books on modern Irish history, including Belfast's Unholy Wars, The Twenties Troubles, and his most recent book, A, Dif a Difficult Birth, The Early Years of Northern Ireland, which was recently pub published by Eastwood Publishers of Dublin, and which I'm sure uh, Anna would be pleased for me to give it a plug, is available both online and I'm sure in plenty of bookshops too. Um, during the, the um, uh, talk, feel free to use the question and answer function on the Zoom task bar. There will be time at the end for Alan to answer any queries that you may have, and trust me, your questions are going to be a lot more, uh, more substantial than anything that I can put together. You'll be pleased to know that I will now be turning off my camera and will leave you in the illustrious company of Dr. Parkinson. Thanks very much. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, my talk uh, tonight is, as Vincent mentioned, Belfast Violence and Border Troubles, the Birth of Northern Ireland, 1920 to 1922. Uh, the two years of community conflict which plagued the north of, of Ireland uh, in its uh, uh, earliest phase uh, was that be that's between the spring of 1920 and the autumn of 1922. It coincided with an unprecedented spell of constitutional and political change. Arguably the violence which erupted in the north and particularly in its leading city uh, in 1920 was not coincidental. And indeed, the relationship between communal disturbances and tension and ongoing political uh, violence were irrevocably intertwined. This is the theme of my recent book that uh, Vincent mentioned, A Difficult Birth, Northern Ireland's Early Years, 1920 to 25, uh, published by Eastwood Books Dublin. Um, this correlation between pending uh, political and constitutional change and a corresponding rise in community violence had already been violent, uh, experienced several times during the course of the 19th century, especially during William Gladstone's home rule legislation, his first legislation in 1886, when disturbances in Belfast uh, actually claimed the lives of well over 50 people. And would of course, it would prove to be the catalyst for serious outbreaks of violence during the prolonged modern conflict, um, most notably in 1972, which I've also written about, far the most bloody single year of the modern conflict, um, uh, when you had events like Bloody Sunday, Bloody Friday, and of course, direct rule from Westminster. This talk has got three sections. The first part will provide a brief outline of the major political and, con and diplomatic events of this short but vital period uh, in the region's history. Part two will trace the origins of violence in Belfast, where most of the serious troubles took place, and outline some of the key security incidents of the two-year conflict. The final part of my talk, uh, Border Trouble, will describe the rather different nature of the security incidents which took place in rural areas, um, many of which along Northern Ireland's new border, including IRA incursions into Northern Territory, as well as attacks by security force members, uh, mainly Ulster Special Constabulary uh, personnel, in places like County Derry, Tyrone, and in particular, the small anti Antrim village of Cushendall. Political change and community conflict. Ireland had, of course, um, been in political turmoil for close to a decade before the outbreak of sectarian disturbances in 1920. The island had been, in fact, on the cusp of civil war uh, in 1914 when Sir Edward Carson's newly armed Ulster volunteers 
appear to be heading towards the conflagration with either the British Army or John Redmond's National Volunteers. Conflict was only avoided uh, at the start of international war. And later on, uh, the seismic events in Dublin during Easter 1916 and the subsequent rise of Sinn Féin uh, in, uh, between 1917 and 1919 meant that Ireland's political landscape was fundamentally different in 1920 uh, from the one which had been in place less than a decade before. The British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, uh, influenced as he was by the creation of new nation states at Versailles at the peace conference in uh, 1919, he was convinced that political compromise was the only solution to Ireland's uh, political problems. This was the premise behind the Better Government of Ireland Bill, which was introduced at Westminster early in 1920. Lloyd George, um, maybe in the vein of another British Prime Minister later on, Tony Blair in the late 1990s, was perhaps thinking to a certain extent of his own political legacy when he proposed the creation of devolved legislatures in Dublin and Belfast. The Northern one would like its um, parental model in London, take the form of a bicameral legislature with the Northern Ireland House of Commons, electing 52 MPs, initially at least under a system, a new voting system, uh, first time in British uh, history, of proportional representation. The bill's long passage, 10 months around about, through Westminster was a fractious one, with both loyalists and nationalists far from convinced about the benefits of a new parliament of their own. For the latter, the partition bill, as they uh, dismissed the proposed legislation, was a double whammy. Uh, it meant for them that they would be cut off from their co-religionists and uh, the rest of Ireland, and also because they would be obviously vulnerable uh, in uh, what was likely to be, and was, of course, a unionist-dominated parliament in Belfast. On the other hand, unionists were concerned by the loss of three Ulster counties, um, uh, Cavan, Donegal and Monaghan, and they were bemused at being asked to back what they initially perceived to be another version of the Home Rule legislation, which they had so fiercely opposed in the recent past. Union, unionism's new leader, Sir James Craig, along with invaluable support from uh, Belfast Loyalist Press, successfully managed to persuade unionists uh, from uh, their best interest would be, uh, there's Craig, uh, who was, uh, of course, to become uh, Prime Minister in, in 1921, and he was in that position for 19 years until his death in 1940. Anyway, Unionism's new leader, James Craig, along with involvement uh, and support from the Loyalist press in Belfast, successfully managed to persuade Unionists that their best interest would be served by this bill, in which they would crucially have control over internal security. And as, uh, as such, uh, they would be, have responsibility for other key areas like health, uh, education, uh, trade, and such like. Westminster, on the other hand, retained responsibility for national defense, income tax collection, foreign policy, and such like. Whilst the new parliament in Belfast was uh, allowed to elect its own government and cabinet the bill became law just before Christmas 1920, and elections to the new parliament were announced to take place on Empire Day, the 24th of May, 1921. This long electoral contest proved to be one of the most bitterly fought in the history of Northern Ireland. The Unionist Party under Craig's leadership fought a campaign under the simple slogan, do your duty. Craig's party received unanimous backing from the Loyalist press, the, the, Bel the Belfast Telegraph uh, in particular, telling its readers uh, that the contest represented a chance to choose between loyalty or disloyalty and uh, a republic or the British Empire. 
James Craig realized from the start that unionist unity was essential if his party were to be triumphant at the polls. In a key election address, he appealed to voters, do your duty, let no one stand aside. The course is sacred, the cause is sacred and worthy of every personal sacrifice. Rally round me so that I may shatter your enemies and their hopes of a Republican flag. The eyes of our friends throughout the empire are upon us. Let them see that we are determined as they are to uphold the cause of loyalty. Despite the shared uh, opposition to both partition and a parliament in Belfast, Joe Devlin's United Irish League Party, UIL, uh, and Sinn Féin both contested the election. Several of Sinn Féin's big names stood for seats in northern constituencies, including Eamon de Valera in County Down, Michael Collins in County Armagh, and Arthur Griffiths, who was contesting for Manor and South Tyrone. Collins was reported to have addressed an open-air meeting in Armagh, uh, possibly in Irish Street, and de Valera, under the watchful eye of RIC personnel, uh, he told the County Down audience to cast your vote against the empire for freedom against slavery, for right and justice against force and wrong here and everywhere. The UIL, which ended up fielding 13 candidates, that's against uh, Sinn Féin's 20, called its manifesto national suicide. And its charismatic leader, we might see now Joe Devlin, who successfully stood in both West Belfast and County Antrim, lambasted partition, which he described as an English dodge. Devlin, speaking at a large gathering, there he is, uh, in Valley Castle, told his supporters, Covenants has fashioned this land to be one and indivisible. Not by directive of England, but fashioned out as one race, with a single purpose and an inspiring ideal. And we are going to make an earnest, a powerful and a triumphant fight against this sacrilege upon our nation. Now, the threat of renewed and sustained violence provoked by several weeks of bitter electioneering was a very real one. But the heavy security presence afforded by the uh, British Army and the RIC stopped this from occurring. This is not to suggest that there was an abundance, uh, an absence of violence or, or intimidation. Indeed, the worst security incident occurred at the Unionist rally at the, uh, at the Unionist, uh, at the Oval football ground in East Belfast, where Craig addressed a large crowd of followers. A young loyalist was shot during a feeder parade, um, uh, uh, Orange and ex-servicemen parade, going from the West Belfast from Strangle Road, uh, crossing the city to the east. Um, and he was shot by an IRA sniper. Um, and later on, a, a Catholic former soldier was also fatally wounded in a retaliatory shooting close to the Short Strand. Alleg allegations of intimidation and physical attack on both candidates and voters were also recorded at this election. A meeting involving three Labour candidates at the Ulster Hall was hijacked by a large loyalist crowd and a number of allegations of photo intimidation were made on election day itself. However, the senior British civil servant and Irish assistant undersecretary Sir Ernest Clark discounted the charge that such attacks had been widespread. Election fever, however, was undeniably real and over 90% of eligible electors were reported to have cast their votes in some constituencies. Although the Unionist Party was widely tipped to be triumphant at the polls, the scale of its victory was a, a surprise. All 40 Unionist Party candidates were successful. And with the small contingent of nationalists and Republicans, uh, six of each, uh, refusing to take their seats in the new parliament. This was in practice an all unionist body. The consequences of this were profound. The new Belfast parliament lacked an effective opposition. 
and the cut and thrust atmosphere of most parliamentary chambers. From the start, Catholics felt alienated from the democratic process and unionists were reluctant to make political compromises on account of what they perceived to be their own precarious position. Uh, within a few weeks of the election, uh, the new parliament was formally opened on the 22nd of June, nearly exactly 100 years ago, uh, by the King George V and Queen Mary at Belfast City Hall. And here we see a, a picture of the occasion. The King's advisors had been concerned over the security issues presented by such a trip. And in the end, uh, George's visit only lasted barely six hours. At the centre of his trip was the formal opening of the new Northern Ireland Parliament uh, in the City Hall. Uh, at the ceremony, the monarch delivered a stirring plea for peace and reconciliation across the whole of Ireland. He passionately told the assembled representatives, I speak from a full heart when I say that my coming to Ireland today may prove to be the first step towards the end of strife among her people whatever their race or creed. In that hope, I appeal to all Irishmen to pause, to stretch out the hand of forbearance and conciliation, to forgive and forget, and to join in making for the land they love a new era of peace, contentment, and goodwill. Barely 48 hours after the pageantry and celebration in Belfast had subsided, the IRA exhibited its unambiguous response to the King's uh, pleas. During the morning of 24th of June, a military train dispatching the officers, men and horses of the Royal Hussars, returning to their Dublin headquarters after their royal protection duties, was attacked by an IRA bomb squad led by Frank Aiken close to Bestbrook and the newly created border. We see a, a slide of the aftermath there. Six people and over 80 horses, including many of those employed in Wednesday ceremonial occasion, were killed when a remotely controlled device destroyed the last carriage of the troop train. This attack and the subsequent high level of Republican activity in Belfast, uh, about uh, a week, 10 days after this, uh, Belfast had a particularly bloody uh, it was called Bloody Sunday, probably the, the bloodiest single 24 hours of, the, uh, of this conflict. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, they, they, this attack and the subsequent level of the, the Republican violence, as well as the freedom of movement apparently enjoyed by the Ulster Protestant Association, the UPA, meant that tension would remain high in the respective communities. Thoughts of peace and conciliation would soon be replaced by the more familiar and dark ones of fear and suspicion. The result was that despite the announcement of a truce by Republicans uh, two weeks later, even more costly uh, loss of life would happen, as I've mentioned, during the second half of 1921 and particularly in the first half of 1922. Although only the Imperial Parliament at Westminster had the power to bring about real and uh, political and constitutional uh, change in uh, the North, the role of the fledgling administration of the Irish Free State in indirectly influencing and arguably in some cases exacerbating the uh, tinderbox situation within Northern Ireland should not be minimalized. The clear failure of the uh, IRA's um, Northern Divisions to observe the organization's declared truce in early July 1921, and the IRA's frequent uh, physical incursions, which I've touched on, into Northern Territory, uh, coupled with the group's paramilitary operations in the North itself, are discussed later in this talk. Sinn Féin also implemented the boycott of Northern goods across the rest of Ireland as a response to the intimidation of Northern Catholics in their Belfast workplaces. This resulted in the uh, destruction uh, and, uh, 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 of a lot of Northern merchandise, which was being transported into Irish Free State territory, 
by road, train and waterway. It also involved a boycotting of Ulster-based banks and currency. And although the boycott did little to foster any unionist feelings that they had good, friendly Southern neighbours. Although loyalists would regard the Southern neighbours with suspicion and anger, it would be political and military events in the rest of Ireland, which would ironically help improve their own prospects within the North. The treaty signed by David Lloyd George and Michael Collins in London just before Christmas 1921 would lead to uh, a massive uh, schism uh, within the Republican movement, which ultimately led to a civil war in the Irish Free State the following summer. This internecine conflict turned out to be even bloodier than the Anglo-Irish War and meant that it was not feasible for the IRA to sustain its operations in Northern Ireland, particularly given the successes which Craig's administration had during the second half of 1922 in terms of countering uh, the IRA within its own territory and the special powers, of course, uh, such as internment. I'd like to look now at the Belfast violence. <clears throat> there were several contributory factors to the violence which broke out in the city during the summer of 1920. The Anglo-Irish War had been uh, raging for a year or more, and reports of attacks on police personnel in the south and west of the island were printed in northern newspapers on a daily basis. Indeed, with an all-Ireland police force, the RIC in frontline action against the IRA and its officers deployed right across the island, it was inevitable that the, there would be some, several northern police casualties. The shootings of two senior Ulster-born RIC officers, Colonel Gerard Smith in Cork and Oswald Swansea in Lisburn, uh, in Michael Collins' authorised um, operations, led to backlashes against Catholics in these predominantly Protestant towns. Smith had been uh, especially vocal in his uh, denunciation of, uh, of Sinn Féin and the IRA, and when Southern Rail crews refused to transport his coffin back to his hometown of Ban Bridge in County Down after a shooting in July 1920, sectarian disturbances broke out in the town. A similar pattern of events happened the following month in Lisburn when Oswald Swansea was shot leaving a church, uh, church service uh, uh, at the cathedral in the County Antrim town. The spring and the early summer of 1920 had also witnessed the large scale outburst of violence in Derry, uh, which had recently elected its first Catholic mayor. These troubles in the Maiden City had involved the British Army, the IRA and the UVF, which had recently organised in the area, and well over 20 people lost their lives in May and June. Another cause of the 20s conflict was the heightening political tension provoked by the Better Government of Ireland legislation, which, as I mentioned, was making its way through uh, Parliament. The Unionist Party's aging leader, Sir Edward Carson, ratched the tension up an arch or two further by delivering a virulent speech at the main 12th of July demonstration, when he urged his supporters not to tolerate Sinn Féin, and at the same time issued a stark warning to Joy George, if having offered you help, you are yourselves unable to protect us from the machinations of Sinn Féin, and you won't take our help, then we will tell you that we will take the matter into our own hands and we will reorganize. Within days of uh, Carson's strident Orange Day warning and the shooting of uh, Colonel Smith in Cork, a large crowd of loyalist shipyard workers forced hundreds of Catholics and a smaller number of socialists to leave their work positions at Harland and Wills shipyards. Many men were beaten with shipyard confetti, iron nuts, rivets, bolts and the like, and they had to swim across the Musgrave Channel to safety. That evening, Trams taking the Loyalist shipyard workers back to their houses, mainly in the west of the uh, north of the city, were stoned as cast by Catholic crowds as they passed the nationalist short strand area uh, and stoning and rioting uh, took place. These two slides, the previous one uh, was looking uh, at York Street and this one is looking <coughs> at disturbances uh, in Little George Street, just to the north of the city centre. That evening, 
the first fatality of the Belfast uh, conflict, a young woman, Margaret uh, Node, was the first victim of around 500 in Belfast alone when she was fatally wounded in the Cromick Street district to the south of the Belfast centre. Later that evening, there was an exchange of gunfire in the west of the city, and the following day, thousands more Catholics were intimidated from both their workplaces and homes. The patterns of violence which would plague the city for over two years emerged within the first few days of the disturbances. Uh, and uh, uh, there were obviously striking similarities with the riots which broke out then and in the late 1960s and early 70s. Sectarian name calling as well as stone and bottle throwing often conducted at flashpoints like Millfield, the Short Strand, York Street, were usually followed by the intervention of the security forces and later during the hours of darkness, the crack of gunfire from both nationalist and unionist quarters. High velocity uh, rifles, which could target potential victims from distances of several hundred yards, even machine guns would be used intermittently during fierce gun battles. Hand grenade explosives were thrown at tram cars and at children playing in the street. And they were also used to start fires at commercial premises, schools and cinemas. I'll come back to those in a minute. In general, it was Catholics who had to endure the double trauma of eviction for both work and home. We might actually have a slide of this uh, available. Many of the most serious incidents had, as in the modern conflict, a tit-for-tat element, such as the killing of suspected Republicans or ordinary Catholics, often after the recent shooting of police officers, either by um, um, uh, loyalist gunmen or by men in uniform. I'll come back to that in a second. Just before I move on to look at the protagonists, uh, I've got this excellent uh, picture, I think it was in the Irish Independent uh, at the time of a young Catholic refugee uh, in uh, the streets of Dublin. Catholics, um, as I was mentioned a moment ago, were evacuated, um, had to leave their homes, uh, intimidated out of their homes uh, uh, particularly in mixed areas where the unionists uh, uh, were in the majority. Uh, uh, many of them moved uh, to, um, particularly to um, uh, Dublin, some moved to uh, Glasgow as well. The protagonists, uh, the first group I want to look at, the Northern IRA. Uh, some writers have downplayed the IRA's role in the 1920s violence, suggesting instead that it merely took a defensive uh, role on the side of the wider Catholic population. However, although the Third Northern Division was initially in the back foot, a bit like they were in fact in 1969, um, but uh, they did experience, uh, and of course they did experience, as in 1969, major organizational problems. However, the overall part played by them in provoking the often spontaneous uh, responses of loyalists uh, to their initial assaults was a highly uh, significant one. The third Northern Division, um, and we'll see a, a slide of them in a few moments, uh, which operated predominantly in the greater Belfast area, organized uh, uh, numerous attacks from police personnel, uh, in the both city and countryside. Uh, here we ha uh, have a, um, a picture from the Belfast Telegraph uh, taken of the um, uh, Third Northern Division on training exercises uh, uh, in the hills above Belfast. Um, and uh, they were also engaged, not only attacking police, but also engaged in attacking Protestant civilians, both in their own homes and on their journeys to and from work. Indeed, the, the um, provoked, uh, the rationale behind the staging of such incidents, which often provoked revenge attacks by corrupt police officers and loyalist gunmen or bombers, appears to have been distinctly counterproductive. And such desperation on the part of the Northern Republican leadership unquestionably led to increased levels of danger for the wider Catholic community. Initially, the membership of the IRA in Belfast was relatively low, probably under a thousand volunteers, and was only after internal restructuring in May 1921, as well as the practical repercussions of the signing of the truce a few weeks later, 
that the Republican campaign in the North, orchestrated by people like Joe McKelvey and later on Seamus Woods, uh, actually gains uh, some momentum. The IRA's chief targets in Greater Belfast, as I've mentioned, were men in uniform, uh, specifically the RIC, and for an 18 month spell in 1921, uh, 1922, the USC. Another Republican tactic was to target trams cars transporting Protestant workers to and from their employment in the shipyards. In two separate attacks within uh, 48 hours in November 1921, seven men lost their lives and many others were seriously injured when Mills bombs were lobbed into uh, their trams as they passed through central Belfast. A press report graphically described the carnage which uh, greeted rescuers in the wake of the second attack. There, that's the victims, begrimed faces, soiled and oily from their day's labor, were smattered with blood which was flowing from their wounds. Their dungarees were also saturated with blood and with their clothing torn in places by the force of the explosion and the fragments of the bomb. The IRA also targeted commercial premises in the city, particularly during a three month spell in the middle of 1922. Nearly 20 business properties were attacked in the course of two days in the middle of May. And in the most concentrated spate of attacks on the 26th of May, there were as many as 13 fires started during the course of one evening, mostly in the Falls and Divis Street districts of West Belfast. The Belfast Telegraph, uh, a very staunchly unionist paper in those days, castigated these false firebugs, maintaining that such attacks formed part of the criminal conspiracy, which is going to make the government of Northern Ireland impossible and to make life intolerable. One of these arson attacks that may actually curtail the school career of my father, John, who lived at the time on the Grosvenor Road in West Belfast and attended the model school. Uh, then situated in Divis Street. And this picture shows the charred remains of, of the school. But Dad had been aware that evening that his school had probably been attacked. He told me smoke was billowing from a building close to the great spires of the Catholic uh, St. Patrick's Church. But his parents refused to allow him to explore. And it was only the next morning as he made his way to school and saw its charred remains that he fully realized what had happened. He told me many, many years later, police were guarding the building, but there was some jeering when the Divis Street boys spotted us. To be honest, I wasn't that surprised because there'd been two previous fires at the school and we had been stoned on our way there a few times. As this happened just a few weeks before the end of my last term uh, and with the new school's premises relocated on the Cliftonbell Road in, in the north of the city, uh, my father agreed to let me start work a few weeks early. As noted already, Protestants were prone to sectarian attacks on their journey to work and also from time to time uh, in their actual workplace. The most grisly sectarian attack the IRA uh, took place in, uh, in uh, took part in, was in a cooperage in, um, in Little Patrick Street near the city center on the 19th of May, 1922, when a nine strong IRA squad burst in demanding workers to declare their religious persuasion. Shots were then directed into the small group of Protestants who had moved to one side and four of them were seriously wounded, three fatally. Even the powerful and influential were not safe from Republican paramilitaries. As in the later modern conflict, IRA assassination teams targeted unionist representatives, particularly those who had been outspoken critics of Sinn Féin and the IRA. Michael Collins was believed to have sanctioned the killing of a distinguished great war general and unionist MP at Westminster, Sir Henry Wilson, in London's fashionable Belgravia district in June 1922. And a few weeks later, an MP in the new Belfast Parliament, William Trudell, uh, an avenue in West Belfast called after him, who was shot as he walked to his draper shot in North Street in the city centre. In the new Parliament, James Craig insisted 
that those who, uh, if those who committed this dastardly outrage thought it would for a moment weaken the functions of this parliament or the steadfast courage of the people of Ulster, they never made a greater error. I'd like to look now at loyalist violence. And as would be the case in the modern conflict, there was no one single unified loyalist paramilitary movement. Although the UVF had performed this, uh, this function, um, reflecting if not actually uh, employing its paramilitary muscle in the pre-Great War period, many of its largely disciplined men would join the ranks of the newly formed Ulster Special Constabulary in late 1920 and early 1921. However, there were still a considerable number of ill-disciplined loyalists who were prepared to join the ranks of the newly formed uh, Belfast Protestant Association, which subsequently merged with the larger Ulster Protestant Association, uh, or else they acted in the capacity of freelance assassin, uh, assassins of Catholics, especially in the streets of Belfast. Over, it's important, I think, to stress that over 60% of all conflict fatalities in the New York, Northern Ireland, that's over 350, were Catholic civilians, who as a group barely formed a third of its population. In other words, Catholics were twice as likely to be killed or seriously injured in sectarian violence as were members of the North majority community. Loyalist groups had, of course, uh, access to most of the huge arsenal of weapons which had been smuggled onto the Antrim and Down coasts during the spring of 1914. Despite the fragmented nature of, um, uh, of loyalist paramilitary groups like the uh, Imperial Guards, the Ex-Servicemen's Association, the Cromwell Clubs, and of course, even the ranks of the UPA, it is highly likely that senior leaders in the paramilitary groups would have had to authorize specific shooting and bombing attacks, even if the subjects of these outrages were often randomly chosen at uh, short notice, often, uh, as I said earlier, as a response to I earlier IRA attacks. This is carried out by impassioned on the ground loyalist assassins. A peace file on UPA activity in East Belfast described the organization as having and I quote, attracted to itself a large number of the lowest and least desirable of the hooligan element and suggested that the group's objective was simply the extermination of Catholics by any and every means. The most striking feature of UPA activity was the raw sectarianism exhibited in some of the actions of its gunmen and bombers. These were believed to have included men like Big Divi Duncan, a, a former Irish guardsman who was reputed to uh, have fired into Catholic districts wearing his trademark suit and trilby hat. Robert Simpson, its chairman and leader uh, of the East Belfast group, who would later be interned. And most notably of all, Buck Alec Robinson, Robinson, who was still a teenager at the time the troubles broke out, was believed by the authorities to have been involved in several shooting and bombing attacks from Catholics. Later in his long life, Robinson accrued a reputation for being a local character who had once been a bodyguard to Al Capone and who, on his return to Belfast, could often be spotted walking his pet lands, which he had bought from Dublin Zoo, walking them along York Street. There are too many horrific attacks involving UPA personnel to consider at length in this talk, but they did include the shooting of two Catholics in the North Belfast tramcar. Uh, they'd uh, crossed themselves on the, as the vehicle had passed the Catholic church. The throwing into the River Ligon of a young Catholic barman by a group of loyalists uh, as he neared his short strand home. He couldn't swim and he subsequently drowned and the setting on fire of a doctor's housekeeper in Donegal Pass. Uh, incidentally, the picture on the screen there is, is um, lots of people were curious um, uh, and many and the authorities used to warn uh, people from gathering in crowds whenever gunfire broke out. Uh, they were curious to find out where 
uh, the gunfire was coming from, and quite often some of them were caught uh, up in the violence. Uh, this is a, a photograph uh, in, in Belfast centered uh, shortly after uh, sniping had broken out. Uh, I was about to say one of the most infamous uh, sectarian attacks in Belfast during this period took place in Weaver Street, uh, situated in the small North Belfast enclave of the Marabone in February 1922. Youngsters had been taking part in traditional skipping games in the street when two intruders hurled a bomb into the midst of the playing children. Six people, including four youngsters, were killed in the blast, and another dozen were injured. Nearly 80 years later, I spoke to the cousin of one of the victims, and she told me, my cousin Kitty Kennedy had just started working in a mill. She lived in Weaver Street, and one night she was skipping in her street when a bomb was thrown in from North Der Derby Street. She and several children I'd met were killed or seriously injured. Her father, John, was a big, fine, religious man, but despite his faith, he never got over the waste of such a young life. The next protagonists, really, I would like to look at are uh, the members of the USC, uh, the Ulster Special Constabulary. Calls for the creation of a special reserve police force to help uh, uh, hard-pressed regular officers and military personnel had grown in their intensity, particularly after the violence in the rest of Ireland had spread to its northeast. Although Lloyd George's cabinet had reservations about James Craig's request for a reserve force to be created in order to relieve pressure uh, on the RIC and the British Army, it was actually financial matters which persuaded them to finally accept uh, a, a localized solution to the North security needs. The USC was formally set up at the start of November 1920, and it was proposed that the new force would be raised at county level, and that it would be split into three sections, each of them armed. The A specials, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't got a picture, for technical reasons I can't show it, but there are two or three of them in the book. Uh, the A Specials were a uniformed, paid, full-time force with around 2,000 officers, whilst a volunteer force of part-time constables, the B Division of the USC, were expected to carry out one night a week's duty in their local areas. The less controversial C Section was permitted to use firearms whilst on duty, but they had no official uniform and they were designed as an emergency reserve force which consisted mainly of older men and were used less frequently. Although advertisements for the new force were actually printed, surprisingly perhaps, in both unionist and nationalist newspapers, unionist organs like the Northern Whig exhorted its readers to offer their services to the new force. An editorial in the Whig maintained prudence and patriotism alike dictated that every Ulsterman capable of bearing arms should enroll in the special constabulary. Unless steps are taken to stamp out murder and sedition, we shall be compelled to go through the most terrible chapter in our checkered history. For many uh, Northern Catholics, the USC is regarded as Ulster's historical equivalent of the Black and Tans, another police force with a mixed reputation. This comparison is not a wholly accurate one, I feel, and indeed the USC made a positive contribution to the society they were serving in by being largely responsible for restoring peace to the streets and the hillsides of Northern Ireland. However, you have to balance that with the debit side. The specials also had a fearsome reputation amongst many Catholics. Future legendary journalist Jimmy Kelly told me uh, uh, about the specials that he encountered uh, near his home on the Falls Road in West Belfast. And he described them as swaggering lights who emerged from a local bar just before curfew time, swinging their rifles and getting into their uh, cage cars and lancias uh, for a night of fun, shooting up the area and teaching, as he called it, the Fenians a lesson. Yet despite this, their clear involvement uh, in, in, in a number of fatal shootings, and I'm going to look at one of them in more detail in a moment, 
The majority of complaints made against the specials at this time did involve relatively low level uh, acts of swearing, pushing, verbal abuse and the like. Many specials were, as I said, former members of the UVF, having served in France, and the majority of them probably sustained a disciplined and professional approach. But a sizable minority were most likely culpable of bringing a sectarian approach to their policing. The USC played no small role in suppressing Republican paramilitarism from within their own borders and also from the IFS. And also 50 officers lost their lives in their endeavors to make peace on the front line, including at least two USC officers in County Armagh, uh, shot dead near Cross McGlen, uh, including John Fluke, who was on his way to church when he was shot dead. Yet the short term success on the security front has to be balanced against the longer term impact of the forces flawed image amongst the minority community. I'd like to look, uh, my next uh, final group of protagonists are what I call rogue cops, miscreant police officers. There is certainly evidence to suggest that several corrupt police officers participated in blatantly sectarian attacks on Catholics, mainly in North and West Belfast. Most of these outrages were probably improvised and were usually retaliatory in the uh, in their nature. However, this should not disguise the sheer brutality of these deeds. Local intelligence confirmed by Dublin's fledgling defence ministry suggested that a series of attacks carried out against um, uh, nationalists in, in Belfast, including uh, some on men purported to have been active Republicans, have been orchestrated by RIC District Inspector John uh, Nixon and RIC County Inspector Richard Harrison, along with a number of lower ranked officers, many of whom were from the Brown Street Barracks on West Belfast Shankill Road. Although they vehemently denied any involvement in a number of shootings, including those of the Duffin brothers on the Forest Road, uh, the fatal wounding of Catholics in North Belfast, um, at least one of uh, these three victims was believed to have been tortured. Uh, the shooting of five men and boys in Arnold Street, also in North Belfast, uh, and the most infamous attack in the north of the city, uh, the McMahon families, which I'll come to in a second. Evidence does strongly suggest the theory that uniformed assassins were implicated in these and possibly other outrages. Otherwise, it's hard to uh, explain the easy accessibility of gunmen to troubled districts of the city, both on foot and by motor vehicle during a period of curfew restrictions. It was a reluctance to directly challenge Nixon's perceived impregnable position. Uh, local unions, incidentally, were vociferous in their backing of him, which deterred his superior officers and senior politicians from taking a tougher approach at an earlier stage. And it is revealing that disciplinary action was only taken against Nixon after Republican violence in Belfast had been quelled, and only then on account of his so-called political rather than criminal, uh, alleged criminal activities. Probably the most notorious sectarian attack in Belfast during these troubles was most likely executed by a gang of these corrupt police officers. Catholic, um, uh, it was that took place at the North Belfast home uh, of Owen McMahon. McMahon was a wealthy Catholic businessman who, although a friend of Joe Devlin, had no known political connections. And he lived at a large property in Canary Terrace, just off the Antrim Road. Following the shooting of two RIC men in Belfast a few hours earlier, uniformed men used a sledgehammer to force their way into the McMahon home during the early hours of the 24th of March, 1922, and rounded up the men and boys of the household. Apart from Mr. McMahon and his six sons, his Donegal-born bar manager, Edward McKinney, a lodger at Owen McMahon's house, was detained. 
Uh, incidentally, uh, according to recently released IRA records, Mr. McKinney was an acknowledged IRA member. So it's likely that the gang would have been aware of this as Richard Harrison was in charge of its detective branch. Though I don't feel that that uh, was in a sense the, the, um, the only motivation uh, to take out a whole family of uh, Catholics who had no uh, known uh, associations with Sinn Féin. Ordered into the downstairs living room, the male members of the family were ordered, you boys say your prayers. Moments later, several volleys of gunfire rang out. As the assailants stole casually away into the night, alarmed neighbours uh, alerted police and ambulance services. The scene which greeted police and ambulance crews who turned up at the scene a few minutes later was horrific. All the men and boys in the room, with the exception of the youngest son, Michael, had been hit by bullets. And four of his brothers, plus Mr. Uh, plus Mr. McKinney, were fatally wounded, uh, as of course was Owen McMahon. The Irish Independent suggested that the brutal slaughter of the McMahon family had been a deed surpassing anything that was done in Ireland during the reign of terror there. Perhaps the most vivid account of the aftermath of this attack was given by the Belfast Telegraph. The house smells of fresh blood. It seems scarcely cold as it spread in large pools and small, uh, small rivers all over the room. On either side of the fireplace lay large pools of blood, thick, heavy, coagulated stuff that turned one sick with horror. In places it was rubbed and disturbed as if someone had macerated fresh bullock's liver and strewn it all about. Border trouble. There were several major security incidents along the newly created border, which brought anxiety and grief not only to those who lived in counties like Down, Tyrone and Fermanagh, but which also led to increased tension within Belfast's back streets. One daring, carefully planned IRA operation uh, along the Fermanagh and Tyrone sides of the border uh, on the 8th of February uh, 1922 precipitated serious conflict in Belfast, culminating in nearly 50 deaths uh, that month alone. In the hours of darkness, a large group of armed IRA personnel crossed the border and took over 40 Protestant hostages. These included uh, several USC and RIC officers, the son of a leading unionist MP, and an elderly Tyrone landlord, I think he was from Ochna Cloy, who'd been used as Republican captors with a non-stop rendition of biblical hymns, as well as several verses of the national anthem. A few days later, another border incident further heightened sectarian tension along uh, across the province of Ulster. Over a dozen specials were ambushed uh, by a large group of the IRA in the county Monaghan town of Clunas. The police officers had been traveling through Irish Free State territory in order to catch a connecting train which was destined for Enniskillen when they were ambushed at the town's railway station. In a fierce exchange, about six people lost their lives, including four police officers and the IRA leader in the area, Matt Fitzpatrick. In addition, the IRA detained five officers, only releasing them a couple of months later. Many occupants of the train's carriages, as well as other uh, passengers awaiting trains and other platforms at the busy station, were forced to run or die for cover. One eyewitness described how shooting had broken out at his carriage and claimed that a bullet had pierced his brand new hat. He also recalled hearing shots being discharged all over the train, mingling with the yells and screams of the men in other carriages. And also he heard one man appeal for mercy and another call out for his mother. Many of the fatal shootings in the Ulster countryside involved members of the police service, particularly its new special constabulary. Um, well over 40 of its members lost their lives in IRA attacks outside Belfast. These often resulted in reprisal shootings by individual members of the police, 
including the shootings of four Catholics after IRA bombings, shootings and arson attack in Desert Martin, County Derry, on the uh, early in May 1922. Two of the most controversial incidents to take place outside Northern Ireland's capital city took place in the small County Antrim village of Cushion Dole and close to the County Down border in farmlands outside Newry. The first of these involved the USC and the British Army in, th uh, in three shootings, which prompted, uh, that actually is a, um, a, a picture in a moment, I'll talk about um, uh, the shootings in Newry, but that's a, uh, a picture uh, of the arson's attack, arson attack by IRA on Protestant houses in, in outside Newry. Uh, but the attack uh, was in, uh, the, I was talking about, was in Cushion Dole. Um, this involved the USC and the British Army uh, in three shootings, uh, which prompted the critics to accuse the security forces of collusion. Of course, uh, uh, an accusation, uh, fre uh, frequent accusation by nationalists during the modern conflict. Although most of County Antrim was loyalist in its political uh, persuasion, Republican training exercises were frequently reported in the glens of Antrim. On the evening of 23rd of June, 1922, a military detachment was ordered to investigate a suspected IRA training exercise in the hills and fields above Cushion Dole. Tension was already high above, uh, across the North following the assassination the day before in London of Unionist MP and Great War General, Sir Henry Wilson. The military detachment met up with a group of USC soldiers uh, and the latter uh, apprehended a young off-duty IRA volunteer who had been cycling on a road outside the village. When the convoy entered the predominantly nationalist village moments later, uh, this detainee, uh, Seamus McAllister, along with two other local men, John Gore and John Hill, who were also arrested, were shot dead in an alleyway in the centre of the village. And incidentally, there's a, uh, a plaque uh, near the spot where they were uh, killed uh, in, um, in the village today. An armed search in neighbouring houses proved to be fruitless. Uh, this provoked a furious uh, response at Westminster where Joe Devlin uh, called the act mil willful murder and a judicial inquiry was established. This concluded that no one except the police and military even fired at all. James Craig's response to this uh, Barrington Ward inquiry, which had been created by Lloyd George, uh, was to set up his own Belfast-led investigation, whose eventual verdict uh, contrasted sharply with the findings of uh, the London one. The Westminster government reluctantly accepted Craig's request to shelve the publication of Barrington Ward's report and also agreed to drop prosecutions against the police personnel who had been implicated in the shootings. The Catholic minority in County Antrim clearly felt aggrieved over this attack by the specials. And this feeling of deep resentment was matched by the emotions of the tiny population in the farmlands around Alton Avey near Newry after an invasion from the uh, Irish Free State by Frank a a Aiken's IRA group during the early hours of the 17th of June, 1922. And this is a, a picture of the aftermath here. Incidentally, Aiken, uh, who was uh, believed to be responsible for this, went on to become a senior Irish government minister. I think he was deputy Taoiseach. He certainly was the leading official at the United Nations many years later. Some uh, 30 IRA volunteers left their Dundalk base in County Leith and attacked Protestant-owned uh, properties for nearly an hour. In this time, a dozen farmsteads and buildings were torched as residents struggled to find refuge in barns and fields. Six people, including the wife of one of the farmers, uh, it was actually believed that she recognised one of her assailants were shot dead and others were seriously wounded. Unionist reaction to this attack was furious with the Belfast Telegraph declaring that neither sex nor age was spurred in the fury of bloodlust again 
um, and in this little colony of Protestant families who were isolated, defenseless, and easily murdered. I've come now to my conclusion, and, and, and in the postscript, um, I'd like to um, just make one or two brief uh, conclusions. The 1920s troubles, which had peaked in their intensity uh, during the first half of 1922, fizzled out that autumn, largely on account of the effects of the special powers legislation, uh, most notably internment, which I alluded to earlier, and the start of the civil war in the rest of the Ireland that summer. Yet the legacy of this conflict would not simply disappear. For the Norse Catholic minority, the unsympathetic approach of Craig's uh, administration to their plight, uh, to their plight and their apparent desertion by their Southern co-religionists would hurt deeply. And this constituted a huge barrier during the new state's early years. The Protestant majority in Northern Ireland, although relieved that peace was restored, they would never forget what they believed had been the destructive role uh, adopted by the Irish Free State in attacking their frontiers uh, directly in the form of physical incursions by the IRA and indirectly in the form of the economic damage caused by the ongoing boycott of northern goods and banks. And also what they perceived to be a northern Catholic collusion with local IRA divisions. This resulted in the hardening of an already pronounced loyalist siege mentality. Today, as the centenary of many of these events is virtually upon us, we thankfully do not experience political violence on a daily basis in Northern Ireland. However, arguably community divisions remain deep, albeit at the moment mostly under the surface and not uh, thankfully uh, in open conflict. But we would be ill-advised to ignore Northern Ireland's modern history if we desire a better future for our children and grandchildren. Well, Alan, thank you very much indeed for that enlightening talk. It was hugely interesting. Um, and uh, hopefully um, our audience is, um, uh, will provide some questions, but I suppose I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. I, I was very struck by the, the picture of the young the young girl you referred to as a, yeah, this, uh, this sort of refugee uh, in, in Dublin. And I was sort of curious as to <clears throat> what sort of numbers of, of people did that sort of migration and, and, and what, was the, what was the welcome they received in, in, in the South? Uh, it was, it's, it's likely it's likely that um, a number of refugees uh, were certainly in the four figures. The number of Catholics intimidated from uh, their work uh, it was probably around about ten thousand, up to ten thousand. Difficult to put a figure on it, Vincent, because mm -hmm. uh, some of them were uh, intimidated uh, from both their workplace and uh, their home on uh, more than one occasion. Uh, some of them went back quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them stayed away. The ones who migrated uh, to places like uh, Glasgow uh, and Dublin in particular uh, were, were probably in hundreds or low thousands. Um, they were put up ironically uh, in Dublin in the old headquarters of the Orange Order uh, <laughs> in, in, in Dublin City. There was a rich irony in that um, in that fact. Um, there were I, I talk about it in in the book, uh, certainly in, in on the Holy War book. Um, there was a um, uh, ambivalent uh, approach in parts of Cork, uh, Cork City, uh, where some of them went um, uh, because uh, they felt that people felt that um, the local IRA should be doing more. To protect their own people, uh, and they, the, you know, and, and and they felt it was on uh, unnecessary uh, 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 pressure put on them at that time. There was some evidence of that, but, but generally speaking, uh, they were they were given that you saw the little girl there with a, a doll. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them were given food. They were given temporary lodgings, uh, and then they went back when things calmed down a bit. Um, and that, I think, was the experience of many of them. I talked to some of them in that category. Uh, mm. Some of them went to stay with Catholic relatives in uh, in the country. 
some some in uh, County Armagh near the border, I suppose in across McLennan area, uh, uh, and County Down as well, and others uh, actually across the border into places like uh, Louth and right across in um, uh, in Donegal on the northwestern side as well. Uh, they, 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 uh, mo most of them, was, it would have been for a limited, relatively limited period. But on the other hand, some of them uh, were believed to have not returned uh, and forged a new life in uh, in in the strong uh, Catholic, uh, uh, obviously the strong uh, communities in Glasgow mm -hmm. and also in Dublin. Okay, thank you. I've got a question in from Glenn. Um, he, he asks, and did many people leave the new Irish Free State from Protestant's community? Uh, difficult to, to say, I kind of put a figure on that, but uh, there, were, there was some uh, migration uh, in, uh, not just in, in this particular period, uh, but uh, later on um, when the um, uh, conclusions of the Boundary Commission uh, were, uh, were reported at the, at the end of uh, 1925, uh, and there was a general leakage of um, uh, Protestants from parts of the south. Uh, 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 but um, um, yes, uh, I, I can't put an exact figure on it, but there certainly were um, perhaps in the low thousands of, 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 of uh, Protestants moved across. I hope that answered your question, Ben. Um, I, I sort of wondered, I was wondering when, when you showed the picture of the the, um, the bombing of the train, you know, what were the sort of immediate reprisals from the, you know, the British government, you know, whenever, you know, uh, something so horrendous happened, you know, on, on the back of, you know, the... the well, the of course, the, you have to think of, remember, they, 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 they didn't want to be too hard because... Uh, and too heavy in their response because the king had just made a, a speech asking for peace and reconciliation. Right. And also, of course, uh, it had uh, it lead <coughs> to the IRA, <coughs> IRA truce, um, which was uh, officially announced shortly after that. Uh, so they were, there were constraints on what they, what they could do. And what they could say, um, but it led to, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, uh, an increase in sectarian tension. Um, um, and I've, I've written about that in the piece for uh, an RTE project quite recently. Um, uh, so, yes, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. And I also, you know, uh, in that um, a tragic incident with the, the McMahon family. I, I, I was just curious, what happened? Was anything learned about um, Michael McMahon? Or what happened to, to, to the, the, the survivor? No, well, I mean, I've tried to um, uh, find out. Um, uh, Eamon Phoenix, a friend of mine, has also, I think he's spoken to your group, your groups, your councils, mm -hmm. but um, we're not sure, actually. Um, uh, the um, uh, one of the sons, at least, uh, died eventually a couple of weeks later. He was buried separately. Um, but you can just imagine, uh, only begin to imagine how traumatic that was uh, for for the group. Um, the existing government files have been heavily monitored and they were closed for many years. Um, and we don't know the full picture, but it is likely... Uh, that there was uh, a, a rogue police involvement in it. Um, uh, the people I've mentioned um, during their lifetime, one was successful in taking litigation uh, against the London Publishing Company for saying that he had been involved. I think if you were to go to the Northern Ireland Record Office and look at the file, which is now open, uh, the correspondence between uh, um, uh, Nixon and Harrison, particularly Nixon, uh, uh, and his correspondence with uh, Dawson Bates, Richard Dawson Bates, the uh, quite right wing uh, unionist, Thomas Ferris minister, uh, and James Craig. Uh, basically, these guys were an embarrassment. Mm. Uh, and um, they, uh, um, Nixon wanted to uh, cross over into the U. Uh, RUC, but they, they, they stopped that. But there were massive rallies in support in West Belfast and the Shanker Road in support of uh, Nixon. And he went on to become 
uh, an independent unionist MP. And some people say he was a mentor for the young uh, preacher politician uh, in Paisley um, uh, in the um, uh, decades later. Okay. And, and how, you know, uh, the, when you mentioned this, Nixon Harrison, like how high did the, the sort of collusion go, or, did, or was that the level, or you know, was it known about, you know, well, from, that, further on? The if, 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 if all that is 100% true, and we, we mm. don't know, and I don't think we ever will, but uh, if it, if it, it, it I personally think it, it was likely that there was some involvement of senior people. Uh, uh, Richard Harrison uh, was actually the detective in charge in, in charge of the RIC's uh, detective branch in the north. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the intelligence that he was getting and, uh, you know, that, in a sense, if that got into the wrong hands, uh, you can only begin to estimate what kind of damage that could be done. Uh, on the other hand, I, personally, I don't think uh, it was um, orchestrated by, uh, by Craig. And this is one of the reasons why I don't think that the events of 1920-22 constitute a pogrom, uh, as some Republican activists uh, think it, 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 it does. Uh, I don't think that they were, as evidence has suggests that they were actively involved in it. Uh, mm -hmm. as far as, and in fact, Craig, as soon as he had dealt with the IRA through the special powers legislation and internment, started to intern the Protestants in, uh, in the UPA, uh, including some of the people I mentioned, like Buck Alec Robinson, uh, some of the other leaders I mentioned earlier, uh, like Simpson. Okay, uh, that's, that's fascinating. Um, uh, uh, ben has, has commented just that uh, he thinks that possibly the sentence of um, the McMahons may be living uh, somewhere in uh, County Toronto. Um, still, so, um, but they may have, may have moved out. Um, but uh, yeah, there don't seem to be any further questions from the, um, the audience. So we'll, um, I know you've had a, a very turning journey today as well, <laughs> Alan. So well, well, I'm sure you'll be well, well, happy to 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 um, uh, put your feet up for for a bit. And I uh, just wanted to to thank you so much for um, a presenting this evening this one uh, your wonderful talk. Um, and I uh, really appreciate you taking the time, and particularly after your your, your tiring journey that you, that you've um, uh, that you that you've had. So, on behalf of everyone uh, attending, um, oh, wish someone um, someone says reference Alt Leve Nuri Mers with the IRA commander later going on to take up a lead political position. Does that suggest that the Southern state condoned such activities? Thank you. There was, sorry, there was just one more question came through there. Um, I. Um, uh, Alan said, "Reference the uh, it's from Colin. Re reference the Alt Neve Nuri murders with the IRA commander later going on to take up a lead political position. Does that suggest that the Southern state condone such activities?" Um, it, it was many years later that he, he got to a position of um, uh, of political power, but as um, uh, it. It, it is concerning, and you only need to look at the internet. I know his family have been very concerned about about this. Um, but um, and and the and, and the effects on the Protestant community in Alton uh not be minimalised. There's no question about that. Uh, and in fact, uh, in recent years, the Orange Hall it it is still a minority Protestant community uh, outside Newry uh, has been torched. Uh, and uh, feelings in the area are, are very, very strong. There's an orange um, uh, a band, uh, um, and feelings are, are still very, very strong. And you certainly cannot uh, minimalize the attitude, how far the government was involved in, but they must have been aware of it, as there's no, it was no secret. Well, we will definitely leave it there. You know, uh, your second chance to get away. <laughs> and, and thank you so much again. And uh, you know, for the people attending, the other the next talk is on Thursday, the nineteenth of August, which will be Dr. Russell Rees, um, talking on Edward Carson, James Craig, the Home Rule Crisis, and the Creation of Northern Ireland, nineteen twelve to nineteen twenty two. And the details are all on the uh, council's website. Um, Alan, I sincerest uh, thanks again. And was, you know, it was a very enlightening talk, and I'm sure everyone uh, who attended it really appreciated your, your your efforts this evening. Thanks very much, Vincent.